Wonderful. Well, I want to say uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name's Steve. I'm uh, the lead pastor here at Welcome Church. Uh, I just have to warn you, I, like many others, I've had this horrendous cold this last week. Anybody else? Anyone else had that over the last couple of weeks? I see a few hands up yet. So if I need to pause and cough or something, I apologize in advance, but I, I will do my best to make it as pleasant as possible for everybody. So uh, warning, warning duly given. Now this is uh, the part of the meeting where we have a talk about a passage from the Bible. And uh, today there's also going to be a video to watch towards the end as well. And because we're starting a whole new series of talks today, a series that we've called Transformed Through Jesus, which that little video you just watched uh, highlighted. My title this morning is Life Transformed Through Jesus. And let me say up front, I believe Jesus is good news. I believe that he can transform every area of our life and our community and our world and our family for good. So let's talk about life transformed through Jesus. I want to start with a question. What do you believe a person is worth? What do you believe a person is worth? Or to perhaps phrase it slightly differently, make it more personal, what do you believe that you are worth? It's often said that the value of something is determined simply by what somebody else will pay for it. So uh, with that in mind, what do you think this picture might be worth? Okay. Now, uh, that is called Shot Sage Blue Marilyn. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's a painting. Um, and if we were to value it based on the cost of the canvas and the paint... It might not be worth, well, it wouldn't be worth a great deal, right? You know, canvas and paint can only add up to so much. But we could have more value, for example, if we added the artist's time in. Depending on how they valued that, the artist's time and effort and attention that had gone into it might add to what that's worth. But whatever you or I think of this portrait, I'm going to tell you this is the most expensive piece of artwork by an American artist that has ever been sold at an auction. Shot Sage Blue Maryland by Andy Warhol, and in May 2022, it sold for, any guesses? Five million? 195 million. 195 million, it's auctioned off by, by Sotheby's. It's a lot of money, right? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, right? If I had the painting, I'd sell it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just me. Who, anyone else will fancy 195 million? Anyway, not just me. Okay, not just me. But how do we place a value, though, on a person? That's just a picture of a person. How do you place a value on a human being? How much value do they have? And, of course, there are different ways of valuing people. I mean, people. Are, are some people more valuable in your eyes than other people are? How much value do you place on yourself? And again, like the painting, there's lots of different ways of answering the question. So, I mean, chemically, we could answer it chemically. And now, if you took the chemical elements of the human body, um, bearing in mind a lot of it is water and is therefore effectively free out of your taps, apparently the chemical elements in the human body, the calcium, the iron, all those bits and pieces, you're worth less than a quid, you know, getting on for a pound, something like that. There you go. But... But the good news is if we were to take your skin, right, your, your skin and sell it at the same rate per square foot as raw cowhide is sold for, um, so you know, we'll, we'll strip the skin, sell it like raw cowhide, assuming you've got the same value for that, you'd fetch around four pounds. Um, though I have to say, following Christmas, I feel some of us might fetch more than others. <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you can find, but if we add those two together you're worth about a fiver. That's good news, isn't it? You're worth a fiver. But there are other different ways of valuing people. Take earnings. The average person will earn between one to two million pounds in a working lifetime at today's rates, between one to two million, if they work full-time for 40 years. All right? Is that how you see your value? One to two million pounds if you work full-time for 40 years. Um, some of you are doing the maths in your head and deciding that you're worth more or less than that. Um, that's all right, let's try working for a church. It's all good fun. Um, <laughs> what about earnings? What about, so earnings, okay, so is that where you put your value? Or you could take your body's component parts. Now, I found one article 
It was an American article, of course. And uh, it tells us your body could be worth $45 million if, okay, that's about 37 million pounds, by the way, if that you took your bone marrow, DNA information, your lungs, your kidneys, your heart, your eyeballs, your face, and a few more bits, took them as components and sold, they were sold illegally on the black market for transfers. They reckon you could get about $45 million. It's not bad, guys. That's some value in there, isn't there? Some, definitely some value. But notably, still only a fraction of what that painting of a person, in fact, just a painting of a person's face was worth. So what are you worth? What's the value of a human being? Now, in the Bible, God, who created humanity, actually does answer this question. So I want to look at that today. And to start that journey... I want us to start with an incident from the life of Jesus, and I'm going to read it. It comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. I'm not going to read it all in one go. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read a bit, talk about it, read a bit more, talk about it, and so on. All right, so we'll get through the story like that, and we're going to look at what is a human being worth. So the story comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verse 36 to 39. The words of it will appear on the screen. Let, let me read it to you. It says this, One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. But who likes a nice dinner invitation? Fancy invitation? It's good, isn't it? Invitation for dinner? Nothing wrong with that. Okay, start again. Sorry, getting distracted. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Okay, so we're going to pause there. We'll read a bit more of the passage in a minute. So we've got Jesus there invited to the home of a Pharisee for dinner. And it sounds like a really normal sort of human interaction, right? Like a nice occasion. Until you remember that the Pharisees were a group of religious teachers and zealots and bigots who thought that they were better than everybody else. And we remember that they seriously hated Jesus. It was this group that were, as you read through the Bible, you find they were always looking to find fault with Jesus. They were always looking to catch him out in his words and to trap him. And in the end, they were responsible for having Jesus arrested and crucified. Now that next verse tells us that this Pharisee had a name, and his, his name was Simon. We're going to find that when we read, read the next bit. And we're not actually told why Simon invited Jesus to dinner, so we have to sort of work it out a bit, reading between the lines in the passage. But it does seem, and we're going to see as we read on, it really probably wasn't for any good reason. He was not a friend to Jesus, and he was not a fan of him. Of course, it's possible he might have been curious to find out more about Jesus. Maybe he'd heard stories of Jesus healing people and performing miracles. Maybe he'd caught some of Jesus' teaching and wanted to know a bit more. But I'm going to say I reckon Simon was probably looking to catch Jesus out in something he said in order to discredit him, in order to cause him trouble, in order to see if he could find cause to have him arrested. Whatever Simon's motivation was, he got a bit of a shock because while Jesus is reclining at the table, He's approached by a woman who we're told had had a sinful life, had lived a sinful life. It's interesting because, so Jesus is reclining at the table. So this dinner party, we're not sitting around the table on chairs like you or I might do. They're reclining on couches. Imagine you kind of your Roman, is it Roman Empire era, era kind of, you know, banquet. This is what's going on. And the Pharisees, they love to be seen to be holy and to have status. And it probably would have been done in a fairly public way because you think, how did this woman get into his house? You know, in the first, who, who led her through the door? Um, but probably this is sort of a fairly open area, probably open to the sky, open area, tables are laid out, food being brought by servants, people reclining. And suddenly, this woman has come through the dark, through the night, and she's there by Jesus. It tells us that she had lived a sinful life. Other Bible translations are less polite than that. They're more straightforward. Um, there are other Bible translations, and remember we're always reading, when we read the Bible, we're reading it translated from the Hebrew or the Greek into English, and uh, they say that she was or had been a prostitute. That's who we're talking about here. Now, whatever you or I might think of that, that would have been a big shock to Simon. It would have offended him. 
His goal in life was for everyone to see how holy he was. And he's putting on this banquet for people to look on and feel inferior to. And suddenly, in the midst of this, this woman, this sinful woman, this prostitute has entered his house. But he's even more shocked by Jesus' response. And you see in the passage, he starts to question Jesus' judgment. It says that he was thinking, if this man was a prophet, he'd know who she was. And of course, he would then expect Jesus to respond in a certain way. And he would have expected Jesus to condemn her, to not allow her to touch him, and to demand that she was thrown out, which is how Simon would have responded. But Jesus doesn't do that. Let's look how Jesus handled the situation. Because we read the passage a little further, you know, see, it turns out that Jesus knew exactly who she was, what she was, but he doesn't react in horror, he doesn't react in shock, he isn't repulsed by her approaching him. Instead, he welcomed her, and then he tells Simon a story, a little parable that's intended to reveal God's heart, what God's heart for people is really like, and how much God values people, even if or when our life is in a mess. Let's read the next bit of the passage, okay, verse 40 to 43. Jesus answered him. It's interesting, I'll just pause there a sec. Simon actually hasn't said anything at this point. He's just thought it. If this man was a prophet, he'd know who she was. But Jesus knew everything. He's God. He knew what Simon was thinking. So he addresses Simon's unspoken thoughts. He says, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. So Jesus tells a story, a parable. Jesus obviously is well known for telling little parables. And they're stories that have a meaning. And this is a story about a money lender and two debtors. One of these debtors owed a small amount. One of them owed a lot. Neither could afford to pay. And maybe, maybe you can start to see already where this story is going, where Jesus is heading. Both of them then have their debts cancelled. And Jesus asks Simon, which will be the most grateful? And Simon correctly responds to the one who had the larger debt forgiven. Let's let's read the last part of the story, verse 44 to 50. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so now... At the end of the passage, we get a little bit more insight into this dinner invitation. Simon invited Jesus, but on arrival, he had been incredibly rude to Jesus. He's like, I invite you for dinner, but he's just so rude and dismissive to Jesus on his arrival. He didn't provide even the basics of what their Middle Eastern hospitality of 2,000 years ago would simply have expected, which would have been water to wash your feet from the dusty roads, A kiss of greeting to show, you know, that you're welcome. And uh, finally, oil on your head, perfumed oil for your head, because probably because people smelled a bit, you know. They didn't, they didn't have, right, God hadn't been invented. There was no, there was no Lynx Africa or whatever it is you like. So a little bit of perfume to uh, make the occasion more tolerable for everybody. Now, those things might sound a bit odd to us, but this is their equivalent of basically telling you where to park, taking your coat, greeting you at the door and offering you a drink. You know, that sort of of stuff that we would take for granted. Jesus has turned up and has just been incredibly rude to him. And yet this woman, this woman who Simon in his heart condemned as sinful and unworthy, had somehow entered Simon's house and she had washed Jesus' feet, not with water but with her tears, cleaning them, drying them with her hair. She had kissed him on his feet, which is quite an intimate thing. And bear in mind, you know, who she is the profession, the, you know, the lifestyle she's living. Jesus is he's, he's living risky here. And he wants this woman to know her value. 
and that she'd put perfumed oil on, well, not his head, but also his feet. This woman, who Simon and especially, um, so, you know, sorry, the society and especially Simon rejected, found with Jesus love, grace, and acceptance, and a forgiveness that the world didn't offer. And so Jesus shows us this woman's true value. He shows us her value in God's eyes. Jesus loved and valued her in a way that Simon and the Pharisees couldn't understand. As a result, she loved Jesus. She worshipped Jesus. And she found his forgiveness for her broken, sinful life. Now, Simon was very religious. He was a Pharisee, right? He was determined to be a good person and to earn favor with God. He, his life had been dedicated to being seen to be holy and being seen to do the right thing. He was a stickler for the rules, especially the moral rules. But this woman had broken every rule of morality. And from Simon's perspective, he believed that he had the right to judge her and to condemn her. But Jesus makes some really key points with the story he tells Simon. Let me just highlight three things. This is, there are three things that this parable Jesus is using to communicate to Simon and therefore also to us. The first point is this. We've all blown it before God. Okay, this is, we've all blown it before God. Not just this woman, but Simon the Pharisee and you and me, everybody. We've all blown it before God. So what Jesus does he, in the parable, he talks about an unpayable debt of money. But being a parable, he's using one thing to talk about something else. Jesus isn't really interested in money at this point, okay? He talks lots about money elsewhere in the Bible, but this isn't really about money. Jesus is using that financial debt as a way of describing, as a metaphor for our moral failure and our standing as sinners before God, which is something that as human beings we all share, including Simon the Pharisee. In this story, God is like the moneylender and we're all the ones in debt. And Jesus is clear, we've all blown it. We all stand before God with a debt of sin, sin, sorry, a debt of sin for the things we've done wrong. The only difference was the size of the debt. Now, Simon probably wouldn't have liked that. He's a Pharisee. You know. By the way, I've... I've met lots of Pharisees in my life. Uh, they may not exist as a group like that. I've met lots of Pharisees, lots of them in church, but not only in church. People who think they're better than everybody else. People who think that you know, they can judge and condemn others. People who want to make sure that they look holy and right on all occasions. Look at me, I'm better than you. Can you tell I'm better than you? And they love it. They love Pharisees are everywhere. They can be moral Pharisees. Hey, you can get them on social media as well. You can get it in celebrity culture as well. The Pharisee who thinks they're better than everyone else and wants to condemn them. Jesus is so clear. We've all blown it before God, all of us. And Jesus in the story talked about one person with a huge debt and one with a small debt. And Simon isn't stupid, okay? He would have understood exactly what Jesus was meaning here. From Simon's perspective, he'd have seen the story very clearly. He'd have said, well, this woman, she's the one uh, with the huge debt. And me, Simon, I guess he's saying I'm the one with the small debt. And from, that was Simon's perspective on life because he'd done his best. He'd tried to be a good person. He'd done good things. Maybe this is you today. He'd gone to church, he'd prayed his prayers, he'd read his Bible, he'd worked hard, he'd cared for his family, he'd been faithful to his wife, he'd given to people in need. Sure, he wasn't perfect, but at least he wasn't like that awful woman there. And as I say, he believed, therefore, he was better than her. He believed he was more valuable than she was and more loved by God and therefore that he had right to sit in judgment on her. There's a bit of an irony in here as well, and you need to know about Jesus when you read his stories. Jesus is often highly sarcastic, Okay, in his stories. He, he really is. He uses a lot of sarcasm. He uses a lot of humor. And uh, that's what he does here because Simon's debt of sin is not actually small. All right. Simon just thought he was. He, he just thought he was better than other people. But even in this short story, if we're honest, if we analyze Simon, we can see that his life is full of hypocrisy, pride, self-righteousness, a lack of love, hard-heartedness, incredible rudeness, you know, deception, even in the way he's invited Jesus, and more. See, I think the real difference between Simon and this woman is not the size of their debt, but the fact that Simon's hins, sins, it's high, it's high, try again, that Simon's sins were what you might call hidden sins, and Simon could get by in respectable company, whereas this woman's sins were publicly known, and so she could be made an example of. That's the difference. So Jesus 
First of all, makes it clear that we've all blown it before God. The second thing he, he makes clear is this, is that we can't fix the problem for ourselves. Now, Simon would have thought he was doing well in God's eyes, but Jesus makes an important point in the story. Okay? Both the big debt and the small debt are equally unpayable. Neither of them could pay. Now, we've all fallen short of God's standards. None of us can fix that problem by ourselves. And the truth is, no amount of holy living, sacrificial giving, self-denial, beating ourselves up, praying, going to church, singing hymns, reading the Bible, trying to be a good person, or trying to do better next time will ever result in forgiveness from God. It's not how we get it. This time, I really mean it. I'm never going to do it again, we say, until the next time it happens. I don't know about you, but I, I suspect that all of us have things in our life that we regret. I suspect all of us have done things that we wish we could take back. Um, I do, I can think of my life, I can think of all sorts of things. You think, if I had my time again, if I was able to go back to that situation, it was I, if I was able to advise a younger me, I wouldn't want to be like that. I wouldn't want to be harsh in that way. I wouldn't want to say the things I said. I wouldn't want to do the things I did. If I could have a do-over, I'd do it differently. I, there's, there's area, I've got things in my life like that. Have you got stuff like that? And the truth is, time doesn't take those things away. Um, Actually, it just accumulates more of them. <laughs> but you, you, can go, you can think of things all the way back to childhood. I can think of things all the way back to childhood that you think, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have been that, but I, I, I should have been better. Truth is, we've all blown it, but we can't fix the problem for ourselves. We don't get that do-over. And no amount of trying to do better will solve it. And believe me, many, many people have tried. Here's the good news. God doesn't ask us to earn his love or forgiveness. He doesn't tell us to do religious deeds in order to be forgiven by him. If that was possible, we wouldn't need Jesus. But we do. We need Jesus, which leads to my third point, the third thing that Jesus is trying to spell out to Simon and to us through this situation. This is it. Third thing, Jesus offers us all forgiveness. We've all blown it before God. We can't fix the problem ourselves. Jesus offers us all forgiveness. The money lender in the story who represents God did not ask his debtors to work the debt off. He didn't put them on an affordable repayment plan. He didn't offer to defer to a later date. He simply cancelled the debt, which means that he paid the price himself, because someone had to pay that debt. It didn't just evaporate. If he wrote off their debt, that meant he paid it. He took the hit. And that's what Jesus offers to do for each of us. You see, forgiveness from God only comes through Jesus. There's no other way, because only Jesus was utterly sinless. Jesus is the only human being in all of history who never sinned. He alone had no debt to pay. And you think, how is that even possible? And the answer is that Jesus was fully a man, but he was also fully God. He's unique in all of history. The man who became, who is God. God who became a man. Jesus created all things. He's God from eternity past, and yet he entered our world as a human being. And he did that to show us what God is like. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. You can read all sorts of parts of the Bible and get insights into God, but you'll only really see the full revelation of who God is when you look at Jesus. He came to make God known to us. It's what Jesus does. He makes God known to us through his life and he also does it personally as we encounter him for ourselves. It's what he wants to do for each one of us. And we see through Jesus the wonderful heart of God towards us, a heart full of love, grace and mercy, the heart of one who invites us to come to him just as we are in all our mess and all our failure. Now I know you might have been put off by judgmental religious people. All right, as I said, I've met many Pharisees. So have you. You might have had bad experiences of church too. And that's happened too many times to too many people. I just want to tell you this morning that Jesus isn't like that. Jesus loves you and me so much that he came into the world to be with us and to make a way that we could be with him for eternity. When Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment we deserve. He died in our place. He paid the price for us. And so now when we come to him, not trying to save ourselves, not trying to justify ourselves, not trying to make excuses, but simply asking for his forgiveness and mercy, 
not trying to bring anything to the table that, that gives us credit, but just humbly saying, Lord, would you forgive me? He comes into our lives to transform us. He forgives us. He restores us to a relationship with God. The Bible puts it beautifully like this in John chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You know, I've, I've met enough Christians, religious people over the years that need to know that last verse. God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world. And it's not our job to condemn the world. He sent Jesus to save the world. So this woman had come to Jesus. She came in all her failure, in all her sin, in all her mess. And she had understood this amazing message of grace. That Jesus loved her and he wouldn't reject her. That he would pay her unpayable debt of sin. And he declares over her that her sins are forgiven. Which is a really shocking thing for Jesus to say. I mean, <laughs> only God can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Pharisees knew that. That's something they did get right. But that's who Jesus is. He is God in the form of man. He came into the world to save and forgive us. And like that woman, we can know a life transformed through Jesus. Jesus invites us to come to him just as we are. We don't have to clean ourselves up first. You know, the Christian message is not that you need to sort your life out and become a better person. And if you can straighten up and fly right and do better and stop doing this and start doing that, then maybe you'll be good enough to come to church and you might just be able to make yourself acceptable to God. No, the message is come as you are. Come as you, you can't come any other way. You don't clean yourself up. Jesus is the one who comes to transform your life and clean you up. And come as you are. But I tell you what, there's amazing good news. You won't stay as you are. Because when you encounter Jesus, and I've seen this so many times, when people meet Jesus, they change for good. Now this story reminds me of another story that I heard from a preacher. His name is uh, Tony Campolo. He's American. Um, I'll be honest with you, right? Be honest. He's a little bit controversial sometimes. Um, there's a few things he said of late I look at, I think, yeah, I'm not sure I quite agree with you there, Tony, just being honest with you. So if you do look him up. But um, I've heard some amazing stuff from him over many years. And this particular story of his, I just thought it's so helpful. And I call it a story. Let me be clear. It's a true story. This is not a story. This is an account of something that happened in his, in his own life. So Tony was, he was visiting Honolulu in Hawaii. Anyone been to Hawaii? Let's look at it. Anyone been there? It, sound, it sounds nice. I've never been. Not many, some, but not many. Is it good? Fantastic. Yeah, you recommend it. Thank you, Jane. Jane recommends Hawaii. It sort of, it feels bucket list for me, to be honest. You know, it's that um, Tony had the joy of going to uh, Hawaii. He's in Honolulu. He says he found himself jet-lagged because of the time difference, so he couldn't sleep. So in the end, he got up and went out and got some food. He says he dropped into a late-night diner, and he was sitting drinking coffee and eating a donut. Imagine that, coffee and donut at what was for them 3.30 in the morning and for him in the afternoon. And uh, he says, what happened as he sat there at 3.30 is the doors to the diner kind of like burst open and suddenly in walked this noisy group of prostitutes, a group of women, came bursting through the door. And he said one of them sat down next to him uh, along with her neighbour as well. And um, it was a woman whose name turned out to be Agnes. She sat down next to him, and in the course of what was quite a, uh, he says, let's call it a rowdy conversation, she said to her neighbour, said, oh, well, I'd like to do an American accent, but I, there's no point. I, I, I'm not even going to try. She said to her neighbour, said, hey, tomorrow is my birthday. I'm turning 39. And the woman she was sitting next to apparently replied to her quite roughly, just, and she said something like this, so what? What's that to me? Do you expect me to give you a birthday party or something? And Agnes replied, I'm just saying, she was all hurt, she said, you don't have to be mean, I don't expect anything, I've never had a birthday party anyway. Now, as that group of women went back out into the night, Tony said that he had an idea, since he was awake at this time of night anyway. He said he spoke to the guy behind the bar in the diner, whose name was Harry, so I spoke to Harry at, at the bar and I said, do they come in every night at this time? And Harry said, yeah, they do every night. And so Tony said, right, what do you say you and me give Agnes a birthday party tomorrow night? Now, isn't that lovely? So Harry apparently leapt on it. It's a great idea. Tony says, can I decorate? Harry said, yeah, get in early, knock yourself out. Tony says, can I bring a cake? And Harry said, no, it's my place, it's my diner, I'm the chef, I'm bringing the cake. That's how, how it went, apparently. Um, so the next evening, Tony came down early 
brought some decorations, started doing the place up. This is what he says. He says, word must have got out, although he hadn't told anyone, because at 3.15, it seemed like every prostitute in Honolulu had filled the diner. <laughs> so it's like, uh-oh. And so at 3.30, apparently, the doors burst open. Agnes and her friends walk in, stunned by this wall of people who all shout out, happy birthday, and start singing, happy birthday. Now, Tony says that Agnes staggered with shock. She had tears in her eyes. She had to be supported to a seat at the table. And then Harry brought out the cake with the candles, and he said, blow them out, and we'll cut the cake. Apparently, Agnes was so blown away by this, she couldn't blow the candles out. And so Harry had to do that for her. But then she found a voice, and she said to him, is it all right? She grabbed the cake. Is it all right if we don't cut it? She said, I live a few doors down. I want to take it home and look at it for a while. I've never had a birthday cake. I just think, oh. So Tony describes it like this. He said, so she took the cake, carefully balanced it, walked out, and the door swung shut behind her. And as the door swung shut, he said, it's just like total silence. So he stood for a moment, and after a pause, he said, uh, what do you say we all pray? <laughs> and Now, I want to quote him. This is his, this is his actual words. I'm going to read what he says. He said, it's weird looking back on it now, leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning in a diner. But it was the right thing to do. <laughs> so I prayed that God would deliver her from what dirty, filthy men had done to her. And, it, and then he adds, you know how these things start. Some 10, 11, 12-year-old girl gets messed over and destroyed by some filthy man, probably someone she knows and trusts. And it all goes downhill from there. And then other men use and abuse her. So I prayed, God, deliver her and make her into a new creation because I've got a God who can make us new no matter where we've been or what we've been through. And I prayed that God would make her new. So I finished my prayer and Harry leans over the counter and says to me, you told me you were a sociologist. <laughs> you're not a sociologist, you're a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? And Tony says he had he said, one of those rare moments in life when you just immediately get the exact right words to say. You know, he didn't think, it's like a, in the instant he got it. And this is his reply. He said, oh, I belong to the kind of church that throws parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> but then he, said, oh, he says this, I'll never forget Harry's response. He looked back at me across the counter and said like this. He said, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because if there was a church like that, I would join it. Now that is a great story, don't you think? But it's also a true one. It's a real incident from his life. And if you read Tony Campolo's stuff, he's got quite a few amazing stories of how God has used him in different ways. I want you to know at Welcome Church, our aim is to be a church for everyone. Our aim is to be a church for you. We're not perfect, of course. There's probably all sorts of things we haven't got quite right. But it's what we're aiming for. And I do love that story and the reason I love it is that it reveals the heart of Jesus towards people and it reveals the value that he places on them. You see, Tony was putting into practice what Jesus demonstrated and taught in Simon the Pharisee's house. He was showing love and compassion from God towards lost, broken, damaged, sinful people. And let's be honest with ourselves. If we are honest, we'll see there are no other types of people. So we're going to pause now and I want to show us a video and it's a video about someone in Welcome Church who discovered for himself what it's like to be transformed through Jesus. It's the first of this series of welcome stories. So let's watch Paul's welcome story. Probably the hardest part of that was when um, Reuben said that he didn't want to see me on his birthday. We were best mates, you know. Didn't even want to be with his dad anymore. Hi, I'm Paul. And this is my welcome story. My early childhood was really good. When I went into high school, my mum and dad split up and that really caused me to go off the rails. Started taking drugs, drinking, fighting a lot. When I changed schools, I met Becky. We got together when we were 14 and we got married very young when we were 22, bought our first house together. A year and a bit later, Reuben was born. We had Grayson eight years after that and Arlo came along 14 months later. So uh, 
the like buses we tried for eight years, but then two came along at once. You don't wait eight years for a bus, do you? <laughs> My career just went from strength to strength. Everything I touched was turning to gold. As the finances went up, so I was enabled to continue this double life. I could afford to hide money away, which funded my drug habit. So in 2013, my life looked amazing. Got offered the chance um, to open an FX brokerage out in Dubai. I was on a six-figure salary, tax-free, had a very nice car, an apartment on the palm, just living an absolute life of luxury, five-star. But then uh, in 2016, came back to the UK and little did I know that things were literally about to implode on me. I was given the opportunity of a lifetime to open a business in Woking. And unfortunately, I decided to pick up old habits where I'd left off. In the blink of an eye, I'd turned into a, a drug addict that couldn't manage myself, let alone a business. The way that I'd started acting at home and the stress that I was under, it caused me to become a very unpleasant person. I just kept on hiding things away and thinking, you know, close my eyes and it'll all go away and it'll fix itself, but it didn't. I've been sent a video from my mother-in-law, um, which was a welcome story in Ryan's story. And I found myself watching it and just in absolute floods of tears, it completely broke me. I recognized the guy in the video. He was someone that I'd played five-a-side football with. I sent him a message and just said that I've seen your story and it really resonated with me. I'd love to meet up and have a chat. So when I sat with Ryan, he really explained to me um, how I could give my life to Jesus, that I had to admit what I'd been doing was wrong, that I had to say sorry for what I'd been up to and just invite him in. From the moment I did that, I immediately felt like I wasn't alone anymore, like Jesus was with me and all of the things that I was about to face in my life, I was not gonna do it alone, that I could have him with me by my side. From that point, um, things really started to unravel. God had started to shine a light on some of the dark corners in my life. Things didn't get better, in fact, they got a whole lot worse. Some of the lies started coming up to the surface. We had to fold the business up. I became a very unpleasant person to be around because of all the stress I was under. That caused Beck and I to decide the best thing for us was to separate. Having to give her my house keys and walk away from the house and not be living there was just probably you know, one of the hardest things I've ever ha have to do. Family's always been everything to me. <clears throat> I never knew what a horrible person I'd become. Probably the hardest part of that was when um, Ruben said that he didn't want to see me on his birthday. We were best mates, you know. <clears throat> and he didn't even, didn't even want to be with his dad anymore. So that was pretty tough. I cried all day that day. I'd planned this very heroic way of ending my life but making it look like an accident so I could, so no one would think anything bad of me. It was just like this, still a very egotistic way of ending it all because I didn't see a resolution. What happened after that was quite a miracle. Beck and I weren't really on very good terms. She randomly called me up and she said that um, she'd spoken to Dub at church and they prayed together. She didn't know whether for us to be together or for not and she prayed for God to reveal what the right thing was. And God spoke to her and said that you need to reach out to Paul. He's in a really dark place. And so she did, she reached out to me and we went on this very cheap and cheerful caravan holiday. It was the best time I've ever had. We reconnected, we fell in love again, had the best time with my boys and Everything just seemed to fall into place, although everything was crumbling. We knew that we would do it together and we had God on our side. As I've pursued a relationship with God, the whole priority list of values in my life has completely changed. Whereas before it might have been wealth, success, career, material things, now it's family, love, honesty, you know, happiness. Jesus has completely um, got rid of those things and, and replaced them with things that are a lot more godly. I've learned who Jesus is to me. He's my protector. He's my savior. He's my role model and, and what I aim to, how I aim to sort of live my life. You know, I still have my pitfalls and still, still definitely uh, make mistakes all the time. 
this has been really, really tough to tell my story. I know it's going to um, bring to the surface a lot of the old, old scars. But I think it's really important for me to, to do that, just to help reach other people. And to, you know, if it can help anyone else that's going through similar struggles and give them some hope, really, that there is a way out. Because in the, in the absolute rock bottom, I didn't see a way out. Jesus gave me a second chance. Wonderful. Wow, it was wonderful. Um, Paul, very much part of our church, and Becky and the family, we love you guys. I just want to say it's really good of you to share that story. It's a brave thing to do. Let's remember uh, we all, don't we, we all have messy lives. We all have uh, things to deal with, and uh, it's important to be able to share, but also to support and encourage one another. So if you see Paul or Becky, give, give them a hug and uh, say well done. It was good. We love you guys. Thank you. I also am aware, Paul touched on some fairly hefty issues there, didn't he? Issues of, uh, of uh, substance abuse, uh, suicide, and I'm aware that for some here today, they may be issues that you're struggling with. And it's really important, if that's the case, don't hide it, shine the light on it. It says the light is shone on it that you can know life transformed through Jesus. And we'd love you. If you need help, you can reach out to us. We've got a great pastoral team who will either try and help you themselves or if necessary, be able to help refer you and connect you on to professional help as well, if that's what's needed, whatever it is in your situation, just, yeah. Anyway, I want to say it's amazing to see Jesus' transformation in people's lives. Uh, and Paul's life was transformed through Jesus when he came to him. And uh, sure, things got worse, right, before they got better. You notice that? And yet God was with him the whole way through, and knew Jesus all the way through. The woman in our story was transformed by Jesus too. She discovered that Jesus loved her, and wanted her to come to him just as she was. And Jesus' offer of new life is available to you and me today, just as we are. He's still transforming lives today. I mean, I think of Agnes in that bar in Honolulu. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know what the outcome was. I know that she had a chance to experience the love of God and how valued she was in his sight. But We don't know the end of her story. But I tell you what, you can determine the end of your story. You can make a decision for yourself. Sadly, Simon the Pharisee didn't know any of this. His heart was full of self-righteousness. He had no understanding of the goodness of God towards broken people. He didn't see how God values human beings. He saw his value as coming from his own goodness and his own achievements. So if he was doing well, he had value. But if he or someone else was doing badly, the value was less. And the truth is, the world still values people like that today. And maybe that's how you value people. But it's not how God sets his value on you and me. So what is our value in God's eyes? What's a person worth? Is it about a quid? About a fiver? Is it those earnings, one to two million? Is it 37 million pounds you know, for selling your organs? Maybe like that painting, maybe it's 185 million. Actually, the Bible gives a different answer, and it's an answer in a completely different category. This is 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 19. It says, It was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You see, God's value on you isn't based on amount of silver or gold, which, by the way, he describes as perishable. And we look at things like silver and gold and think they're going to last forever. But God's eternal perspective is these, these are just passing elements. But you were purchased with something so much more, but with the blood of Jesus Christ. God himself shed his own blood for you. The sinless one died for you. So Jesus shows us how much value we have in God's eyes by the price he paid for us, his blood. He gave his life on the cross so we could be forgiven and transformed. And I want you to know this morning that in God's eyes, whatever we may have done, and however messy your life may have been, Jesus thought, you were worth more than any amount of money you were worth dying for to him. So I hope today has begun to reveal how much God loves and values you, however much you or I do or don't value ourselves. We're all precious to him. And over these next six weeks, we're going to continue this preaching series. We'll show a new welcome story each week, and we'll hear some stories from the Bible of how Jesus transforms lives. 
And we would love to invite you to join us week by week. Just come as you are. So before I finish, we're going to do one more thing. We're going to pray together. All right, and we're going to pray together. Is that all right? And I want to invite you all, wherever you are, and you just bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's just come to prayer. And first of all, I want to, uh, if you're someone here today and you want to give your life to Jesus right now, if you've heard what I've said and you think, I want that transformation, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to invite you to pray along in your heart with me and make that prayer of commitment to Jesus. And uh, we'll do that in just a second. But there may be others here and you think, well, it's interesting what you're saying, but I'm really not ready to do that. But maybe you've got still questions about God. Why don't you pray a different prayer just in your own heart? It's easy to pray, by the way. Prayer is just thought or speech directed to God. He'll hear you. And the prayer is just this. God, if you're there, would you reveal yourself to me? That's it. Just that, in your own heart. God, if you are there, would you reveal yourself to me? I, I know he answers that prayer, believe me. But for those here you're saying yeah i'm ready i want to give my life to jesus i want to know that transformation i want to know that forgiveness why don't you just pray with me right now lord jesus thank you for the great value that you place on human life including mine lord jesus thank you that you thought it was worth dying for me lord would you forgive me for the things i've done wrong oh there's so many messes and mistakes in my life lord i'm sorry would you forgive me and would you transform me? Jesus, I'm not promising today I'll never do it, anything again because I know I will. My, my, my request is, Jesus, come into my heart and change me. I can't do it on my own. I need you. Jesus, forgive me. Would you be my friend and my saviour? I surrender my life to you right now. Amen.